Hello, this is Francesca speaking, current president of the SFP London Student Chapter. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us on this gloomy Monday morning. If you're not in London, I hope that the weather is nicer over there. The speaker today is Agle. She was a, a student at Imperial College here at Imperial College, so we're very happy to have her back. Um, she received her PhD and uh, from um, the research group Hayes Lab, and then she moved uh, to start her uh, career as a fire engineer at Arup London. As part uh, of her PhD, she studied uh, traveling fire computationally, but also experimentally. And this experiment was a follow-up of her uh, of her PhD thesis. Um, it was an experiment that had involved many different research centers and uh, a lot of different uh, researchers from our lab. So we're very happy to hear about this experiment for the first time um, officially. So thank you, Agle, for joining us today. And um, I'm very excited to hear all about X1, this uh, the largest exper compartment um, fire experiment up to date that was performed in 2017 in Poland. So I'll now uh, pass uh, the word to Egle. Thank you for coming and you're welcome to start. Um, hi, Francesca. Let me just share yeah. my screen. Uh, thanks for the kind introduction. Um, so uh, as Francesca has mentioned, um, Today I'm presenting the work that we've done in 2017 um, uh, together with uh, lots of collaborators, including CEREB, AROP, ITB and uh, the School of Fire Service in Poland. Uh, I'm now working in AROP for the past three and a half years, but this work was done while I was still at Imperial um, as a working as a postdoc. And uh, this experiment has been a huge team effort, so it would not have been possible for all of these people mentioned here. So I would just like to highlight their names as well. It seems like a long list, but you usually need support from a lot of people to make this happen. Um, and this presentation builds on a paper fry experiment inside a very large company large and open plan compartment called X1, which will be published in prior technology on the 1st of October, and it will be open access. So please uh, have a read if you want to learn more details about this. So <clears throat> let's start with the background. Uh, uh, in general, fire safety engineering in buildings uh, is based on providing multiple layers of protection. So they may include prevention, detection, adding suppression systems, small control, compartmentation, and structural resistance usually comes uh, as one of the last layers of protection. And the most important one, which uh, takes place after all of the other layers have failed, uh, and here are some of the examples of buildings where structural resistance of the building has been significantly impacted. So the, you either had partial or complete collapse of the structure. So in the top left corner, you can see the portrait center building. In the bottom, you can see the faculty of uh, architecture at EU Delft. Uh, in the bottom right corner, you can see Madrid Tower, Vinsa Tower in Madrid, and in the top right, uh, you can see the Pasco building, which is one of the most recent fires, which has led to a complete collapse of the structure. And here you can see a video uh, of this building at the time of the collapse when it was being extinguished by the firefighters, which has led to multiple losses of lives, both of the occupants in the building and the firefighters extinguishing the fire at the time of the fire. Uh, all of this is important because these fires can lead to collapse and loss of lives, which is important then for evacuation of people, access for firefighters, and 
and all of these fires uh, fires occurred across large open plan floor plates. We had them traveling across the floor plate and between different levels on a building, which are more representative of large open plan places like this, which are typical in modern architecture. They have offices or large atriums or just in general large spaces for the fire to develop and spread. And most, actually most of the experimental evidence that design is based on currently is based on relatively small scale fires, typical of our bedroom, bedrooms or living rooms uh, in star and dwelling houses. Uh, and the fires which are more likely to occur in large open plant spaces can result in highly non-uniform temperature distributions. And here you can see just an example of expected temperatures you could get at different locations across the compartment as fire spreading along it from left to right. And in these two different elements, we would experience different heating regimes which could impact their structural response and redistribution of loads and forces. Uh, and to bring more background to the scale of experimental evidence that we have today and what is being proposed by the architects and industry, uh, here you can see a plot of the floor area on the x-axis against the surface to volume of enclosure ratio. And what this shows uh, is um, re-radiation re between surfaces and how compact the space is. So here you can see a typical relationship for a rectangular compartment, rectangular scale compartment, and the ratio is very high when you have floor areas of about 100 meters squared, where you would have lots of re-radiation between walls and other surfaces while it becomes smaller as you go into much larger compartments. Uh, and most of the fire tests which have been done today sit closer to this side of this graph, so up to about 100 meters squared representative of relatively small rooms, uh, while real buildings and proposals by the architects actually sit here. And this is mostly for office buildings, so buildings where you have large open plan spaces. Uh, a few examples are these five buildings here, so Fichard, Kirpin in London, one Graham, 21 Lime Street, and Leiden Hall, all of these compartments or buildings have compartments in this range, and architects actually propose it buildings which go up to 5,000 or even 6,000 meters squared of open plan floor space, so significantly larger than the tests we had test evidence we have to date. Um, and this, when designing these buildings for structural fire safety, uh, the results from these tests are blindly extrapolated to these large spaces, so we cannot know with a high level of certainty certainty how conservative this extrapolation is uh, in a design. Uh, here you can see a list of the largest experiments carried out today for compartment fires and they are represented here on this graph with the largest ones being the Tesola test in Czech Republic in 2015 and uh, one of the Cardington tests with a floor area of 340 meters squared. And with our test of X1, we wanted to push this envelope a little bit further and we carried out experiment in Poland in 2016-17 uh, with a floor area of 380 meters squared. Uh, the SOA test was a test which also aimed to uh, study fires naturally spreading across the compartment, while the Cardington test, while having a large flow area, uh, all of the fuel was ignited simultaneously, and the purpose of this test was to study the structural response, but not the actual fire, natural fire spread and fire dynamics. Uh, so traditional design is based on walls small scale tests and actually smaller than the test I've shown on a previous slide, uh, usually up to floor areas of 100 meters squared. Uh, we assume 
uniform based on these tests, we, we assume uniform temperatures within the compartment and that that is a conservative assumption. And also because of this, they have limitations to the applicability to different buildings. For example, your code parametric fire curves cannot be applied to compartments larger than 500 meters squared in floor area. Um, so most of new modern buildings with large open plan spaces would fall outside of the limitations of these curves uh, and we need to understand what would actually happen in a building with large compartments which what we are currently doing so x1 uh, experiment is the experiment which aims to push that envelope a little bit further in our knowledge and experience so the main aim of the experiment was to capture a natural fire in a large and open plan enclosure they used to use solid wood fuel local ignition and trying to study natural fire propagation in the space. Uh, X1 is part of an experimental program uh, of more than one test. So it was the first test in a series. Uh, there were two more tests carried out in 2019, X21 and X22. But uh, this presentation mainly focuses on X1 and more results will come out for X2 within the following year. And the target fuel load uh, was that representative of typical office spaces with between 350 and 400 megajoules per meter squared. So the building where we did the test is located in Poland. It's an old concrete farm building. And we refer to it as Obora, uh, which means a cowhouse in Polish. Um, it's located near Warsaw in a rural area in the county of Poland. And the experiment was carried out in a large open plan space, which had the dimensions of approximately 35 meters by 11 meters. And you can see the plan of the open plan space here. Uh, there was some adjacent structure to that compartment which was not used for the test. Uh, it was closed out to make sure that the fire doesn't spread within it um, as it was not part of a large compartment. Uh, and this is what it looked like from the inside uh, before just as we came on site. Uh, we had uh, an open plan internal dimensions of about 6.46 uh, six meters. Uh, on the sides here, you can see some cow feeders. The compartment did not have an even height. It ranged from 2.9 meters to 3.2 meters at the center. And the open plan floor area was about 308 meters squared, as I mentioned before. Uh, the structure was supported by concrete columns spaced at about every 3.7 meters. So uh, the aim was to study a natural fire spread. So we tried to, to design a continuous fuel bed to allow for the fire to spread uh, evenly. Uh, we developed a, a methodology to design the fuel load, which was uh, which we first implemented for the soil fire test in the Czech Republic in 2015. Um, just to explain the concept of the methodology. Uh, normally, when you have a fire, you would have ignition, you would have a fire spreading until it reaches the maximum fire size, increasing in size with time. So it, it can be both a ventilation or fuel controlled fire. But in a case of fuel controlled fire, you're more likely to reach a specific fire size maximum fire size and then it's just start spreading across the compartment and fuel bed control. This is representative of a fuel bed control fire, which could be identified by having clear leading edge, which is the front of the flames and a trailing edge, which would be the back of the flaming combustion burnout. You can still see some smoldering flaming combustion within a crib, but not actual infringing flames. Uh, and the main variables which would be controlling the fire size would be the fire spread rate, 
for the leading edge and learning rate for the trailing edge. So they did a literature review of existing correlations for wood grip fires. They are obviously only available in really small scale. So they use them just as an indication to guide the direction of how we design the wood grip. And we mainly based it on the work by Harmati and Heskestad and Thomas from the uh, 60s and 70s. So the final wood grip that they used had uh, soft foot sticks with the dimensions of three centimeters by three centimeters, and it had an approximate moisture content of 9.6%. The goal of the test was to have low wood moisture content, which is less than 12 percent, because with increasing moisture content, it would could significantly impact the fire spread uh, and make it extremely slow, which we wanted to avoid to make to represent more realistic fire spread conditions you would expect uh, in an actual building. Also, the vary to the wood trip. To, to be a continuous one rather than stacks of wood grip in the compartment. And we mixed in some fiberboard at the bottom of the grip, which with the aim to help with the ignition of the fire and to facilitate a fire, faster fire spread, uh, also more representative of what you would expect in actual buildings. And this is based on experience and observations from previous large-scale tests, like the one in Tosawa and Portugal, where it took hours for the fire to start spreading, which is unlikely to happen in a real building. And then we built the crib to have four sticks per layer in multiple layers. So in total, we had 11 layers of the crib. Uh, other objectives while designing the fuel load and the test were to try to minimize the risk of the collapse of the building uh, because uh, the firefighters who gave us access to the building wanted to keep it safe for future experiments for themselves and also to make sure that the experiment was carried out in the warm season and there was no rain or impact of low outside temperatures which you could expect in winter in total, the final fuel load was about three and a half tons of wood, which was distributed internally within the compartment between the cowed feeders and the columns. It, it was about six meters wide by 10 to nine meters long, uh, with an ignition on the left hand side here. And you can see here in the top left, it was ignited by placing a line of pans filled with methanol and ignited them simultaneously and allowing for the fire to spread naturally. Also, uh, coming back to the objectives of the experiment, one of them was no collapse of the building. And as we did the experiment in an old cowhouse farm building, obviously there were some damage to the existing structure. So for example, here you can see a concrete column with exposed steel rebars, which if heated could uh, potentially lead to localized failure or col collapse of the structure. We had openings in the ceiling or openings to the adjacent structure. In the ceiling, we had an attic which had uh, a wooden roof structure, which we did not, did not want to ignite as well. So we try to protect the structure as much as we can to minimize that risk of failure. So we protected columns with aerated concrete blocks, uh, sealing with mineral wool, and we closed uh, as many of the openings in the ceiling uh, and the adjacent compartment with fire resisting plasterboards. Uh, uh, in terms of instrumentation, we had uh, lots of different tools. So we had visual cameras, drone footage. We had about 30 thermocouples. Uh, we've also installed Raspberry, car, Raspberry Pi cameras inside of the compartment. And unfortunately, only one has survived. Uh, uh, we made a 3D scan of the building before and after the test. Uh, we also used some IR cameras and a verification 
to report the conditions on a day of the test. In terms of triple couples, uh, we had a limited number of them and specifically selected to capture the key fire dynamics of the fire spreading across the compartment and then horizontally to see if there is any non-uniformity. So we had a series of thermocouples installed between rock wall and the ceiling to see if rock wall is actually protecting the ceiling and there is, if there is any sudden increase in temperature which could lead to potential damage to the structure. And for fire dynamics, we had a series of thermocouples placed near the beam soffits to capture temperatures as fire is spreading across the compartment and also a series of thermocouples on the sides to capture any horizontal non-uniformities or vertical non-uniformities as we had uh, thermocouples at different heights on the columns. And this is what the experiment looked like just at the start of ignition where you can see a line fire being ignited and the continuous wood grip. Um, now, before I go into the results, uh, I would like to cover the topic of human dimensions, which is not always uh, talked about in presentations like this. Uh, such experiments would not be possible without the help and support of a lot of people and collaboration between different institutions. Uh, for example, X1 was a large effort and collaboration between Imperial College, Arup, ITB, CERVID, and the School of Fire Service and Firefighters in Poland. Uh, in, a, in Imperial College, you may know Professor Guillermo Moraine, who was leading the work together with myself and the others. We had help, lots of help from Wojciech and Protra in Poland, who helped us find the building and instrumented and also from our sponsors and collaborators, Panos and Mohammed and Sarip. But in addition to these people, we had lots of help from all of the students at Imperial and without them, it would not have been possible because uh, it's a large physical effort as well as lots of planning uh, and making sure it happens. Uh, we had about one week to prepare for the experiment and we had 18 people on site. Uh, so this is what the building looked like just as we came on site. Uh, and this is what it looked like after the fire as we left it. Uh, and to get to the actual experiment, there was lots of work of tidying up the existing building, breaking down some of the existing concrete structure, painting it over, installing thermocouples, lots of logistics, collaboration and help from all of these PhD students, our collaborators and support uh, from the fire service in Poland, uh, which is not usually covered, uh, which you cannot actually see the effort which is put in in the papers which are published in the literature. And I just wanted to highlight, I say big, a huge thanks to all of these people. Uh, here you can see the wood crib and it might seem like a simple thing, but it's something it just takes a huge effort to build. We had a team of 18 people and it still took us one whole day to build just the crib itself. And here you can see just a short hit yes, of the process of how it was built from relatively early morning until it got dark in the evening in a setup for the actual test. Uh, and at the end, we managed to do it with lots of effort and uh, everyone being extremely tired, I mentioned, after the experiments and being exhausted. And once again, I would like to thank all of them because uh, without these people, it would not have been possible. It's not an effort of a single person, but a huge team. Uh, and this is a, just a team photo of almost everyone after the test uh, at the fire service in Poland. Um, so coming to the actual results of X1, uh, we ignited the building in 2017. Uh, 
in early September. Uh, and as I mentioned, the ignition took place at one end of your compartment and we allowed it to spread naturally. So here you can see the fire just a few minutes after ignition. And uh, here is a photo of the building about 10 minutes into the fire. So you can see fires erupting, some small external flaming, and you can see some firefighters putting some water in the building, but they were mainly putting it to on the external envelope, so to make sure that the fire doesn't spread into the attic. Uh, there was uh, no fire service intervention internally for the fire spread. Uh, and here you can see, I guess, from the front end of the compartment, so the other direction of when it was ignited. And then the bottom right, you can see what it looked like after the test. Uh, so overall, the fire spread uniformly across the compartment and acceler accelerated as it got closer to the far end of the compartment. You can also see a huge buildup of the smoke layer towards the end. Uh, and here you can see mineral gold which has fallen as the fire has passed uh, the location where it was fixed. Uh, here is some drop foot footage just to show how the fire spread initially and the huge small cloud that it has generated as a result of the test. Um, so as I mentioned before, in general, the fire was relatively localized and re uh, small at the beginning, and then it grew in size as it progressed through the compartment. Uh, and there was some localized external flaming Here you can see the fire as it was uh, closer to the end, to the, the end of the compartment at its, its maximum size and the huge smoke that it has produced. Uh, bearing in mind that this building was relatively close to the Warsaw Airport in Poland. Um, uh, so coming to the results, uh, I would first like to start with this fire spread. Uh, which is usually used to define traveling fires, so fires which would spread across the compartment. And we wanted to see how it, how the observations in this experiment re relate to that. Um, so on this plot, we plot time against the distance from ignition. Uh, and if you look at the plan, so the ignite, uh, if you consider X, at zero meters location of ignition and the end of the fuel bed as 10 to nine meters, you can define the fire spreading by the fuel bed, unburned fuel bed, the flaming area of flaming combustion and burnout area. So location where you no longer have a flaming combustion and this image which I've shown before, defining a clear leading and trailing edge uh, around the area of flaming combustion. So, and here at the bottom, you can see what we would expect a typical uh, fire, uh, fire spread to look like uh, in a highly fuel controlled traveling fire with approximately a constant fire size. So you have a, a slight uh, a burnout area here, virgin fuel and actual fire. Uh, for X1, we had we tried to measure these edges based on visual footage. So for the leading edge, we used footage of a GoPro camera, uh, and for the other locations, footage from handheld cameras because internal uh, Raspberry Pi cameras, unfortunately, have not most of them have not survived during the experiment. Uh, and we used image processing uh, and camera, 3D camera reconstruction to get uh, an indicative idea of the location of these different edges. So here you can see the location of the leading edge, which was mostly based on this footage with 
X is representing positions detected using uh, image processing. And here you can see the trailing edge. Uh, and what this figure mainly shows is that the fire did not burn uniformly, but you had it continuously traveling across the compartment and ac accelerating, as you can see, from a leading edge. Uh, the, we do not see the fire flash uh, flash over, but accelerate uh, as it was spreading through the fuel bed rather than uh, seeing a simultaneous ignition uh, of the fuel on the far side of the compartment. And we also do not record temperatures, uh, which would be typical, typically expected in flash over conditions ahead of the fire. Um, on average, the fire was about 30 megawatts in size based on a total fire duration, which was about 10 to 5 minutes. Uh, and the amount of fuel which we had in the compartment, uh, based on most positions I've shown on the previous graph, we also try to estimate what was the heat release rate uh, with time. So here, the solid blue line is the estimated average heat release rate and this shaded area represents the estimated error range. Uh, this, so this indicate, and this is based on uh, positions, estimate positions of the leading trailing edges, uh, normal combustion of the wood fuel, etc. And we estimate that at the peak, the fire was about 70 megawatts in size, and the fire growth was representative of a fast fire growth rate typically considered in a building design. In terms of thermocouple measurements, uh, as I mentioned before, we had a series of thermocouples along the central line of the fire, evenly distributed at each bay. And on this plot, you can see on the x-axis time versus gas temperature at the beam soffit. So at position, thermocouple position T1, which was not directly above the fuel bed, this is with Temperatures we recorded if the maximum up to seven to eight hundred, and T three, T six, and T nine as the fire progressed across the compartment. This shaded area represents the estimated error or correction range as the raw thermocouple data was corrected for radiation. So it's it's probably somewhere in between this range. And as I mentioned before, the fire burned for about 10 to 5 minutes. So you can see the cooling at this time. Uh, from this figure, you can see in most thermocouple locations, career leading near field and far field regions. So near field would be the area directly exposed to flaming. So where you have these high peaks, and far field, far field would be temperatures approximately less than 600. So as if I has passed a specific area of burning specific thermocouple. So in most cases, they dropped to below 600 as it flames then past a specific thermocouple. And overall, the temperatures ranged from about 120 to 1035 degrees Celsius indicating high non-uniform temperature distributions and with the differences of up to 900 degrees Celsius at any given time. And also, this thermocouple data, in addition to the leading edges and trailing edges that I've shown before, also indicates that the fire has traveled across the compartment. So if, for example, we take thermocouple data position T3 and T6, um, the distance between these thermocouples is about 11.2 meters, uh, and the fire spread this distance in about six minutes. And you can see that this had relatively slow fire spread when compared against thermocouples T6 and T9, where you can see high temperatures at a much closer time interval, indicate, also indicating that the fire has accelerated with time. Now, uh, going to the vertical variations in a compartment, 
Uh, here you can see a subplot again of time against gas temperatures. Uh, and first, I would just like to report again the temperatures at the beam soffit level. So here, this is this is these are results I've showed on a previous slide from Bay One, Bay Three, Bay Six, and Bay Nine. And if you compare them against the temperatures at the height at 2.4 meters from the floor level and one meter adjacent to the columns, we can see that temperatures in all most bays except for Bay Six at the ceiling are most of the time higher than lower in a compartment than at the columns at the heights of 2.4 meters and one meter, while at Bay 6 temperatures, you can see this yellow curve being higher than results at the ceiling soffit, indicating higher temperatures by up to 315 degrees Celsius. Uh, and this is probably because of the thick smoke layer which has built up towards the end of your compartment and mixing of the gases uh, with the smoke. Um, and overall, the vertical temperatures range between 50 to 700 degrees Celsius, also indicating highly non-uniform temperature distributions uh, as before horizontally. Uh, we've also done a quick comparison of X1 results against some of the existing design files just to see how representative they are or indicative, but uh, we did not go into too much detail as, as this is more just a high level study and obviously much more work is needed to compare all different methodologies which are available. So here, if you come back to the gas temperatures at the beam socket that I showed before, and if we just take thermocouples T3 and T9 as an example, so closer to the location of ignition and far end of the fire first, we compared it against a uh, traveling fires methodology, which we have published in 2015. This is obviously not the only one, not the only methodology available in the literature. There are many, and this one is just used as an example here. Uh, but it would be interesting to see how these results compare to other methodologies. So, if we take this methodology, uh, here you can see what would be not expected, but uh, generated gas temperatures at the specific thermocouple positions. And uh, the traveling fryer here has been assumed based on the average fire size over the whole experiment, uh, based on the positions of leading and trailing edges, uh, and also in adjusting the heat release rate so that the total duration does not exceed the actual duration observed during the fire. We also did uh, a quick comparison against Euroboard parametric fire curves, which are typically used in a structural fire design, performance-based design of buildings. Uh, and similarly, we've plotted ventilation controlled and fuel controlled fires. And in calculation of these curves, we assumed the same compartment with the same dimensions and linings, just different distribution of the fuel load. And in addition to that, we also compared against the standard fire curve, which is the most common one used in testing of different products or prescriptive design of structures for fire, which is this red line here. And in general, the high level observations uh, just indicative at the stage is that uh, the traveling fire methodology used here is uh, cannot capture the changing fire size and accelerating nature of the fire. And it's the average fire size assumed is actually slightly more representative of the fire towards the end of the experiment. So there's a lot more work needed in this area and 
most of the existing methodologies at the moment assume a constant fire size as the fire spreads across the compartment. Then for all of the fires, there are significant differences in thermal exposure in terms of fire duration, especially for parametric Europe fire. Uh, parametric fire curves and the Eurocode, uh, both ventilation and fuel controlled. There are quite huge differences in peak temperatures assumed. Um, so ventilation controlled parametric fire would peak at about 7-15 degrees Celsius, while uh, experimental results indicate temperatures up to 1000 and then also heating and cooling, how the structure is heated and cooled as parametric fires and standard fires would um, assume everything heated uniformly with time. Um, in general, the specific, the specific traveling fire methodology with this tend to be more conservative and uniform fires and accounts for non-uniform temperature distribution, but whereas a huge need for further experimental work and improved design methodologies which can capture the behavior in this test and further tests more accurately or in a more representative manner. Because the intent of these tools is not to predict the fire but to capture the likely fire scenarios. Uh, so to conclude, uh, X1 is the experiment which aimed to capture a natural traveling fire in a large enclosure. It is uh, the largest compartment fire experiment carried out today in terms of open plan compartment flow area and allowing the fire to spread naturally. Uh, we captured a relatively fast traveling fire with distinct leading and trailing edges and the it did not burn uniformly, but it continuously traveled across the compartment and progressively accelerated across the compartment, especially more as it reached the far end of the compartment. Uh, and temperature field was not uniform, but highly non-uniform, varying in both space and time, which is not what is currently assumed in traditional design methodologies, as, such as parametric fires or standard fire exposure, which are based on small scale experiments up to 100 meters squared. Uh, so uh, once again, coming back, why it matters is because we are trying to build large complex buildings with huge open plan areas and we do need more evidence uh, to show certainty and give some in terms of uh, that the designs that we are producing are conservative and can uh, capture most likely fire scenarios because research just on a structural response has shown that uniform fires may lead to different uh, structural response mechanisms compared to non-uniform fires. So we, need, we do need more understanding on the actual fire dynamics uh, and testing. Uh, so I would like to thank you for listening. If you have any questions after this presentation, you can contact me uh, at this email address. Um, also, again, a reminder, you, you will be able to find more details and the uh, graphs that are shown here in the paper, which will be made available from the 1st of October in prior technology. And I'd like to thank all of the collaborators which took part in this test. So, which was mainly led by Imperial College with the help and support from Arab, Serib, ITB, and our colleagues and friends in Poland, the School of Fire Service uh, and the Fire Service itself. And once again, to all of these people without whom these experiments could not have happened or taken place. Thank you, and I'll take any questions. Mm. <laughs> Cool. So if anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to pop them into the Q&A chat. Um, so you've got a few couple here already. Um, thank you, Egbe, by the way. 
for a very Thank interesting Thank you for presentation. inviting me. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, very interesting to hear as always. Um, and I'm not just biased because my name appeared in the presentation. <laughs> uh, cool, so go on here. Thank you, Egle, for this great presentation. Is the threshold size of the compartment, so how large it needs to be, uh, mm. for traveling fires to occur known or estimated uh, or is the size of the compartment even the most uh, the most important variable in to determining whether flash overall traveling fires occur? Yeah, that's a, a very good and tough question because <laughs> <laughs> I think this is uh, what we, uh, we need. These questions have not been answered yet, and that's why we need more experimental evidence. It could be that the size of the compartment is not actually that important, but we believe that it is because even 380 meters squared, what we've done here, is still really small when you compare to the actual building. Some proposals to have open plan for areas of up to 5,000, 6,000 meters squared, uh, and most common buildings are 1,000 to 2,000, so it's up to 10 times larger than what we have here. So. I really have no idea where you would have a spreading fire growing in size and then some local flashovers or not. And that's why we need test evidence or better evidence from the fires which have already happened. Um, so, so you don't have any intuition about like uh, whether it be like a sudden shift or like particular growing in certain areas or anything like that? Um, uh, it's difficult to answer because uh, here we really had a relatively small compartment with mm. uh, ventilation, which was only about 20% of the openings, which in modern offices would be a bit larger. Uh, the available window and the floor space. So I would expect some probably you like local accelerating fire growth and probably some decrease in size and growth. Uh, the existing evidence indicates fires spreading across the compartment at more or less consistent size. Uh, in the World Trade Center fires or prior in Madrid, but there are not enough details to really conclude anything. And yeah. the same when the fire will become traveling fire or not. You can yeah. see some science in this test. Uh, but yeah, I, I think more research is needed for validating computational models, which can we could try to explore. Mm, it's very it's a very complex problem. I'm sorry yeah. to ask <laughs> the challenge. Just no, there's very few um, people who have seen as many. <laughs> I think it's good to pose this question uh, so people understand the limitations of existing knowledge. Uh, mm. um, so thank you to whoever asked that question. There's another question from Dogen here. He asks, to what extent and how does the ventilation openings in the flow paths affect the behavior of the traveling fire yeah. in large compartments? Another very similar question. <laughs> so uh, I think in terms of availability of openings, I think we would. If you have little openings, we would probably and limited openings and oxygen. So in relatively smaller compartments, uh, you would get larger. Longer burning rates, so smaller burning rates uh, as it starts with oxygen, so uh, slightly longer fire durations and probably a bit larger fires. Uh, if you have more ventilation, we are likely to go closer to fuel control and in these smaller, faster spreading fires, but it's all a speculation, especially going to larger compartments. Uh, with our current evidence uh, and with the for, for experiments that we've done in exactly the same compartment with 30% less fuel, the fire dynamics were completely different. It was a significantly smaller fire, so like it's a 
a mix and match of how much ventilation and how much fuel with respect to ventilation you have. Mm. Yeah, it's never it's never one thing, independent no. thing in fire science, is it? <laughs> I think there are so many things, the type of uh, linings you have, if you have a timber ceiling, that's another yeah. next question, uh, which we're also trying to study and answer. Um, it's, well, it'll be interesting to see the results of them, maybe in another presentation uh, yeah. in the future. <laughs> um, there's another question here from Francesco, uh, which I was thinking about a bit myself, actually. Uh, he was asking, um, she, he also says thank you for the great presentation. He asked if, uh, when you mentioned cooling and heating as mm. the fundamental difference uh, between theoretical, the current theoretical methods uh, versus reality, um, mm. do you have any suggestions for how we could include heating and cooling effects in uh, into current models um, to better predict uh, realistic behavior. Uh, so I think current traveling for our models uh, more or less include that just by the nature of assuming a localized fire spreading across so different locations experience different heating and cooling. It's just uh, how accurate these models are in terms of fire growth and acceleration and that needs more development. Uh, in that area, uh, but uh, we are called parametric fires. I know, like, we should not just be considering when we design buildings, we should just not be designing against traveling fires or your code parametric fires. So I think we need a combination of both to test the building under different scenarios. So even though parametric fires do not, or standard fire do not capture heating or cooling of the fire spreading across. They are still important to capture some mechanisms of failure and just to expose to extreme conditions with structure and compare and contrast against traveling fires because you may have different structural failure modes which have been observed in literature and doing computational models by many different authors and different yeah. structures. Yeah, no, it's actually because I, I was I was thinking as well because when you were saying um, earlier about the fire being very the temperature field and the fire being very inhomogeneous mm -hmm. in this experiment um, and I was thinking about how I mean obviously you've got the inhomogeneity of like steady traveling fire but whether um, people are working on kind of like almost you know almost like uh, stochastic or like varying inhomogeneous uh, fires and stuff as well if that's if you know anything like that going on as well. So we, at the moment, it's only done, at least in Europe, at very high level. Mm. So we do, when we do our time equivalent studies for building, we consider different fires from different methodologies using a stochastic approach. Mm. And we select some design fires, which we then progress into more complex model to subject the building to. Uh, but and a very important next step once we get more computational power and availability would be to actually expose the actual structure to all of the possible fires. Yeah. Rather that's... than just heating it up and finding the worst case fires in terms of heating. Uh, but I think, yeah, we still have some work to do. Uh, yeah, it feels like quite a lot of advances in fire science come alongside advances yeah. in computation. Um, yeah because it's just so such a big problem. Um, what's it here? Uh, and we've got uh, one last question um, from uh, Anonymous here, uh, which is probably a good one to end on, asking what's the difference uh, of this experiment, the X1 traveling fire, to yeah. uh, previous large fire experiments like Cardington, Lisbon, or Tisova um, that you mentioned in that yeah. graph? So in terms of, <clears throat> I think there are a few differences. So in a flow, open plan flow, flow area, so X1 is about 308 meters meter squared, while Tissova was about 270, and this bone was closer to 100 meters squared. Um, Cardicton is the closest one in terms of flow area to this test, but 
instead of having a continuous fuel bed, it had localized wood crypts, which were ignited simultaneously to study a uniform fire and impact of a uniform fire on the structure. So it didn't focus as much on the fire dynamics, but the structural response to uniform fires. Uh, and uh, the other traveling fire tests all had a continuous fuel bed uh, made from the wood crypt. But in our case, we also used wood fiber board to facilitate a faster fire spread through the wood crib. Because in this one into solar, it took hours for the fire to grow and to start spreading across the compartment. And we wanted to avoid that in this test based on their previous experience. Um, and also different conditions. Uh, to saw what was carried out in winter and there were other things which happened. So all of these tests bring some important knowledge and I think it's worth revisiting all of them together and see how you can build on them and maybe develop further tests or improve methodologies. Yeah. Okay, that sounds, it's a, a good, good point to end on I think it's so good oh um oh we did have one one last question just coming at the yeah. end there um which was just asking about um whether you've compared these experimental results to any FDS models uh done in the same thing no we have not done that uh but uh yeah uh, there's lots of work to also do with FDS models to validate them um, and but I think this is something in the works but we have not done that yet yeah, again, thank you for the question there at the end. Um, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you for answering all the questions, Egle. Uh, Francesca, maybe you'd like to just say a few words to end. Um, yeah, thank you again, Egle, for uh, sharing this with us. It was very, yeah. very interesting. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. This video will be available on our website in a couple of weeks together with um, all our past um, webinars. So if you're interested, if you like this, go over there and you'll find some other interesting webinars. Um, that's it then. Thank you all for joining and we'll see you again.